Hello there. My name is Josh Yelton. I am the lead pastor at Redemption Church. I just want to say thank you for watching this sermon recording. I pray that it's an encouragement to you, that it's a blessing as we go through God's word. I also pray that, that you would be spurred on in your relationship with the Lord. And if you would like to know more or support us at Redemption Church, you can find us at redemptiongillette.com. So as we continue through the book of Malachi this week, uh, our section in Malachi is Malachi 2, 17 through 3, 5, which says this. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or by asking, where is, the justice, where is God's justice? And he, behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and, the fuller's, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in the former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, and against those who oppress the hired workers in his wages, the widow and his, the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. How are we doing today? Good. Well, it's great to see all your smiling faces out there this morning. If I hadn't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Josh. I'm the lead pastor here at Redemption Church, and just want to welcome you. If you are new with us, I'd also just encourage you to go ahead and fill out a, a Connect card. We have some Connect cards there on the back table, uh, just a quarter sheet of paper, paper where you can fill out some information. Uh, we can just get to know you a little bit better, and we can follow up with you that way as well. So I'd encourage you to do that this morning. Uh, we also have some bulletins back there if you didn't get one. Uh, there's, there's a lot going on this time of year, as you might have noticed uh, when Tim was talking about the announcements. There's a lot, there's a lot happening, um, and so if you want to grab a bulletin too, and it can follow along that way. Um, but uh, maybe you've been here for the last couple of weeks and you've been a, a part of this uh, Advent series that we've been doing. Uh, maybe you're just joining this morning. Either way, uh, we, are, we are in an Advent series uh, in the book of Malachi. Um, and Advent, that word actually it comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming or arrival. Okay, so specifically as we celebrate the Advent season, the coming, we're, we're celebrating Jesus' coming, Jesus' arrival. Um, and that's, that's what Advent is. And really, Advent is, is, is two parts. There's the, the first Advent, right, which, which talks about Jesus coming, the incarnation of Jesus where he came down from heaven. He lived as a human among us. You know, it was during that Advent that's already taken place that Jesus, he lived a, a sinless life and he died a, a sinner's death and then he, he actually was buried and rose again on the third day. That was his first Advent. And then there's also a second Advent, which, which is when Jesus will return in glory to rule and to reign and when he will declare victory over sin and death once and for all. And so ultimately, the advent of Jesus is a promise, a hope that does not disappoint. And so as we go through this advent season, it's an exciting thing. Maybe for you, uh, advent is maybe a, a new concept. I know for me, I had no idea what advent was until we moved here almost seven years ago. I had no idea what advent was. And, and so as we're learning advent, my family has come to just love, love advent and celebrating that together. And so if, if it's new for you, I would encourage you to, to, to take some time this year uh, with your family, by yourself, and, and just celebrate this Advent season. You know, there's a lot of ways to do that. You can go through a devotional with your family. You can do an Advent calendar. You can read through the Gospel of Luke. 
Um, and, and if you follow that up, it's going to start with the first advent and then his ascension at the end of Luke. There's a lot of things you can do. And, so, and if, you want, if you need some more ideas, if you want to talk about that, if I can help you, I would love, love to talk with you about that and help you through that. As a church, we're going through this book of Malachi. It's going to help us. It's helping us to prepare and celebrate the advent of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Two weeks so far, we've talked about God's faithful love, and we talked about his holiness, his holiness last week. And in particular, last week, we saw that God's holiness requires right worship. And this morning, we're going to continue in that conversation. We're going to talk about God's mercy as he's sending a messenger for our redemption. So go ahead, and if you would, turn in your Bibles, if you're not already there, to the end of Malachi chapter 2. And as you turn there, let me just encourage you this way as well. If you, if you need a Bible or if you, uh, you want a Bible, you know somebody that needs a Bible, we have some extra Bibles over there. We would love for you to grab one and take one home, um, give it to somebody that needs it. We, we believe in God's Word. We believe in the authority of Scripture, and we believe that we need access to God's Word. We need to be studying it and reading it for ourselves. So I'd encourage you to take one uh, if, 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 that, if that's you this morning. So you'll find Malachi in your Bible. It's at the end of the Old Testament. It's the last book right before the Gospel of Matthew, right between splits uh, Old Testament and New Testament. And as we've already discussed the last couple of weeks, the, the book of Malachi is, is actually one of the, the, the 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. It was written to the Israelites after they had returned from captivity in, in Babylon. And, and really, uh, this, this book is written at a really, really important time in the history of Israel. A really important, important time in the, in the history of God's people. It was in the middle of the, the fifth century before Christ, and it was this time of renewal, this time of recommitment to the Lord. They just come back um, from that captivity, and every, they were just kind of figuring it all, all out again. It was a whole new generation of people, and so we, we're, they're, gonna, they're in that season of renewal. We've also talked about the significance of Malachi as being the last book in the Old Testament. Sometimes this is, this is missed as we're going through our Bible and we're reading. I don't even know if maybe you've never even opened up Malachi and read Malachi before, but this is the last words, the last words that we see uh, in the, the, is actually the last prophetic voice that's recorded until John the Baptist over 400 years later. And so these words that we see here, and especially the, 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 in chapters 3 and 4, we see this prophetic uh, word to the people of God. Um, and that this, is, this, this is important. This is what they were left with before over 400 years of silence. And, and, and so, and, and let me also say this too. I mean, as we go through Malachi, if, you, if you've already read through this, maybe ahead, or you've been following along this series, there's a, there's a heavy tone of judgment, right? Can we just acknowledge that? Like, there's a, there's a heavy tone of judgment in this book. And you might be asking yourself or, or wanting to ask me, like, why in the world are we doing Malachi for an Advent series? But really, uh, Malachi, he, he is calling out the priests and the Israelites for their apathetic hearts towards God. He, he does this in, in a really unique way, by the way, uh, brilliant way. He, he basically anticipates their response, Right? He anticipates, he, he says, this is the statement, this is the truth, and then what, what's called disputations, he, he anticipates the response, their objection, and then he brings more evidence to that case. And that's what we see here. And, and though these, these disputations are throughout the book, the ultimate purpose of Malachi was to assure the Israelites that God still loved them, and he was keeping his covenant with them. So in the passage that we come to this morning, we also see one of two messianic prophecies in Malachi. So if, if, if up to this point you're being like, why in the world are we in Malachi for this Advent series? Hopefully that becomes really, really apparent uh, this morning as we get into chapter 3. And so as we talk about that, as we talk about uh, prophecy, messianic prophecy, I think it's helpful um, for us to just slow down a little bit. We, sometimes we throw those words around. Uh, and, we, and we use those words, uh, maybe, maybe we don't use those words, or maybe we use them and we maybe don't fully understand what they mean. But in the Bible, a, a prophecy is someone speaking God's message to their contemporary situation. Somebody is speaking God's message to a contemporary situation. So, so a prophecy uh, can be a, a pronouncement of judgment. It can be a warning. It can be a, a, a call to repentance. It can be 
the delivery of blessing or the promise of future events. But in all of these things, God is using a person to speak for him to a very specific group or person, a very specific time. 2 Peter 1.21 actually says this about prophecy. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So essentially, prophecy is men speaking from God. There's no mistaking the source of prophecy here. God is the source, not man. God is the source of prophecy. And so we, we see this. We see that also a, a specific type of prophecy as we come to this morning called messianic prophecy. My favorite personal favorite type of prophecy is messianic prophecy. And messianic prophecy is the foretelling about who Jesus will be, what he will do, or what will happen to him. It's this beautiful picture of, of God's great plan of salvation that is carried out in his son, Jesus. So from the beginning of Genesis, through the prophets, our present age, to the one to come, the Bible, it's all one big story, and it's all about one person. It's about Jesus Christ. And so as we look at these messianic prophecies of the advent of Jesus, we, see a, a, we, we will see a, a focus on the prediction of what is going to happen in the future, and in some cases, what has already happened, as is the case this morning and what we're going to talk about. So often, too, I know this is a lot, but often, too, as we look at these prophecies, a lot of times in the Old Testament, they actually combine first and second advent as we talked about a moment ago, together. So you actually see them together in the same passages, in the same context. And that's, what, that's actually what's happening here in Malachi. The first advent is going to be clearly addressed in verse 1, as, and we'll get to that. And the second advent is discussed in, in verses 2 through 5. Um, and uh, so, so really, this, as we go through this this morning, uh, maybe that was just a whirlwind for you. Uh, but as we go through this this morning, this really has great significance for us because we, it's going to prepare us to celebrate this Advent season um, in a way that, that, that we, can, we can see that, that, that first Advent has actually already been fulfilled. Jesus has come. We, we, don't, we, don't, we aren't in the same place that they are when they receive this word, waiting with ant eager anticipation for Christ to come, for the Messiah to be revealed. And so with, with his advent, with Christ coming in this fulfillment, we have this great blessing and the gift of redemption. Salvation is made possible through his coming. And so as we, as we go into all of that, I say this every week, but as we go into all of that, as, as much for my heart as for yours, let's slow down. I, I, if you couldn't already tell, I'm really, really excited about this. I've been waiting to get to this. But, but let's slow down and let's just pray as we go into God's word and we, we dive deeper into what he has for us this morning. So if you bow with me, let's go to the Lord. God, I thank you for this time. God, please calm my heart and my mind and slow my words down. God, I want it to be your words, your voice this morning. Uh, God, please speak this morning. Please speak through me this morning. God, I, I pray uh, that we would hear from you today. I pray that we would respond to you today. God, thank you for your word that we can, we can hear and we can know who you are we can know about your love. God, we can, we can know what you, you call us to, what you expect from us, God, and I pray that we would respond in, in faithfulness today. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for your word, and it's in your name we do pray. Amen. Amen. All righty. Everybody take a deep breath. So as we, as we jump back into Malachi here, verse 2, 17, um, I, I just, I, I want to I do a quick review I know when I say quick, you guys are all thinking there's no way that Josh does anything quick. Um, but a quick review, if, just, just in case you maybe weren't here for the first couple weeks. We talked about God's faithful love. Those first five verses really emphasize God's faithful love. And then last week we talked about uh, this, this implication, uh, this characteristic of God's holiness. You, you're not going to find the word holy or holiness anywhere in Malachi, but it, it is implied, the character of God is implied by this false and faithless worship that we see from Israel, that we see from the priests. And we talked about that this, yesterday, last week. We talked about how God's holiness actually demands right worship, right? And so that's where we get to in verse 17 here this morning. It's, it, we come to the, the next of these disputations. Basically, Malachi accuses them of wearying the Lord, wearied the Lord. It means to make him grow tired. 
Now, God can't actually physically grow tired. So what is this talking about? It means that God became disinclined toward them because of their indifference, because of their callousness, right? If you ever have a persistent child, right, that just, you guys probably don't have that. You don't know what that's like at all. I, I have a persistent child that I love dearly and I'm not going to name, but is very, very persistent, right? But, but their persistence, unlike our, one of our children, is, is actually in, in, in obedience. What they're persisting in, what they're continuing in, what they're doing over and over and over again is direct disobedience to God and his commands and what he's called them to do. And it's wearied the Lord. What we find is there this, this persistent defense, persistent defense of themselves. They were adamantly defending their innocence before God. They say, "Wait, we, how have we wearied you, God? What are you what are you talking about?" Right? All these disputations that we see, see throughout the book are framed that way. This is the statement. They were like, "What do you mean? What are you talking about? How have we not honored you? How have we how have we wearied you?" And, and, and the reality is, is that these people were living a life of poverty. They were living a life of oppression. And, and, and they thought that God had dealt them a hand that was unbefitting of his chosen people. They're like, God, this isn't fair. They missed the point of God's mercy, though. God gave them such incredible mercy and grace, and they missed it. They were left with, the, with bitter, self-centered hearts. And so starting in verse 17, Malachi brings... Basically, a multifaceted uh, attack of God, uh, representative of these people. So, the, the, basically, their objections towards God, this multifaceted attack towards God is represented in this one verse. And they basically had threefold, a threefold charge against God. I think this is really important, too, that we understand uh, this as we go through Malachi, and hopefully it'll become clear why. But the first charge is that evil is good in God's sight. They actually believed that, that, that God and how he was treating them believed that evil was good. They could only see the prosperity of their surrounding enemies. They had no capacity to, to, to see the grace and mercy of God in their own lives. They saw others right? They, 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 they saw others, they, and in their estimation, those, those other people that were doing better than that, that were prospering, they, they were more sinful than them. Why in the world was God not, not taking care of them, not blessing them, not, not providing for them and intervening for those people that are evil? He, it, it, surely, if God's not going to protect his, his people, then he doesn't really value good, or maybe he thinks that evil is good. And, and that is their, their, their train of thought, their line of thinking. The, the Israelites had suffered so many trials, and they had such a skewed vi- version of sin, they were ready to believe that God delighted in favoring their enemies over them. That's the first charge we see. The, the second charge was that God delights in evil. They ac- accuse God of actually delighting. Not only does he think evil is good, but he's delighting in evil. It was such a blatantly false accusation. How could they even consider God associating with evil, let alone delighting in it? And it was because they were blind to their own sin. How terrifying a thought that we can grow callous and numb to the sin in our lives. I pray that that would never be true of my heart. I pray that would never be true of your heart. May God eradicate any pride or fear, any sin in my heart that pushes me away from him. But again, when you are blinded by your sin, anything goes. When you, when you don't acknowledge the sin in your life, anything goes. You will find yourself hiding behind evil, deception, and selfishness, essentially perpetuating that downward sp- spiral that leads to death. But we must wake up and see the, the truth for what it is. God is so far from removed from evil that he is the absence of it. That's the second charge. And the third charge comes in the form of a question. Comes there at the end of verse 17 where it says, where is God's justice? Essentially, they blamed God for their problem. And they claimed that God is not just. Where is the God of justice? God seemingly did not judge the the wickedness 
severely enough, the wickedness of, of the people around them. They weren't looking at their own sin and saying, hey, God, judge us, judge my sin. No, they're saying, look at that person over there. You see how bad that sin is? God, do something about that. If you actually care about the evil in the world, do something about that. They were indignant that God wasn't protecting and vindicating them. And surely this was the height of their depravity. They were so self-absorbed, so blind to their own sin that they openly questioned if God was even worthy of their praise. They questioned God's justice, not, not based on the reality of their sin, but on the, the basis of their circumstances. And that, by the way, is never a good platform to view God's justice. If you're asking the question, where is God's justice, and you're starting with your own, uh, your own righteousness, or you're starting, with, you're, you're, you're starting with your own circumstances, that's never a good platform to view God's justice. But somehow they became blind to their own rebellion, bl- rebellion blind to their own sin. They had openly they reversed their morality. Isaiah 5.20 actually puts this really well when it says this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They'd gotten everything twisted and were caught blaming God. And so the question there, coming back to that question is, where is God's justice? And we actually, we we can look to the next chapter, look at verse 3 to find that answer. And just as, as, as a, a quick reminder in chapter 3, the kind of the context of Malachi historically. They're in the middle of the, the 5th century B.C., um, and the temple had been rebuilt, but the people and the priests were still kind of floundering in their worship. The, the, the prophet Isaiah, um, who came a few centuries before Malachi, he gave the, the, the people of Israel such high hopes, right? You think about the, the suffering servant, you think about the messianic prophecies of of. The, 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 the prophet Isaiah, and they thought that the Messianic age was going to dawn immediately. They thought it was going to happen immediately, and this, this was certainly the pattern that was established in their history. Since Moses' tabernacle and Solomon's temple, when, the, when, the, when, the, when they were built, God's glory, his presence was, was there. And so they, they assumed that this was going to happen as well in, in the rebuilding of the temple. The prophets Haggai and Zechariah added to these hopes by assuring the people that if they rebuilt the temple, the glory of the Lord would come. And so the the prophets are predicting this. They're seeing this in the history of their people, and they're, they're, they're excited. Just like you and I should be excited. They are excited. They were, they were waiting for the Messiah. They're, they're, they're expecting these things, and they, they rebuilt the temple, and they're waiting for God's glory, and there's, there's no glory. Instead, there was famine and poverty, oppression. There was robbing of God. There was unfaithfulness of covenant vows. And the temple was devoid of such glory, of any visible manifestation of God in Malachi's day. You talk about disappointment. And that disappointment, by the way, remember, this is the last words before this age of silence. That was 400 years of disappointment, over 400 years. It's a long time. It's a long time to wait. But not only were they disappointed, but they were also disappointing, right? They had wearied God with their apathy. We see that clearly from these three charges against God at the end of chapter 2, but we see God's answer starting in 3.1. God's glory had, hadn't yet been present in, in the temple, but Malachi prophesies here that there will be a messenger. And if we read closely, we actually see that there's, there's two messengers repre- represented here. Let's take another look at verse 3-1. Read it with me. 3-1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. This verse right here, this, is, this verse right here is why I'm, I'm excited this morning. It's why, it's, it's, it's why we have reason to celebrate Advent, by the way. This verse right here, it, it speaks directly to these Israelites. It's a very significant passage. In, in this context and in the entire Bible, it speaks to these Israelites 
who were proving themselves unfaithful. Right as they are ignoring their own sin and calling God out, God is revealing to them his plan of salvation. He's, he's revealing to them his plan for their welfare and their, their future blessing. It reminds me, it takes me back to Genesis 3, right? Where, where, they, where Adam and Eve have sinned and they've introduced sin into humanity. But then, but then what happens is it, it, during the kiss, cursing, at the, right in the same chapter we see the curses of that decision, we also see this, this promise, of, uh, this, this plan of salvation that God has in 3.15. And so th- th- that's that same concept. Right as they're ignoring him and calling him out, God is revealing to them this plan of salvation. And this, so this verse contrasts the ignorance, the sinfulness of man with the faithfulness and the love of God. It sets the tone for how God is going to execute his plan of salvation. And that word that we see that, that, that stands out, should jump out to us, is the word messenger. If you recall from the beginning of our study, the name Malachi actually means my messenger or God's messenger. But this isn't talking about Malachi. Messenger can mean prophet or priest or angel. Actually, here it carries, it carries a dual meaning. Messenger in, in 3.1 3, refers to John the Baptist in the first instance and Jesus in the second instance. This idea of preparing the path for someone to come after, it actually comes from the ancient Eastern kings custom that they had, basically where they would send somebody out ahead of them and they would clear all the obstacles. They would remove all of the barriers so that the king could, could, could travel on a, a, a road that's nice and smooth and, and no issues. And that's the concept here. We, we, we know very clearly, too, who this first messenger is because of the four, all four Gospels actually associate this messenger with John the Baptist. So we know clearly who this is. John the Baptist, he prepared the way for Jesus by preaching repentance. That, that, that was the objective of his ministry, was to, to preach re- repentance for the forgiveness of their sins. And, and, and the second messenger here it ha- actually has two titles that give us clues to his identity as well. It says, the Lord, the messenger of the covenant. Those are referring to the same messenger, the same person. It can also be translated here, angel of the Lord. And anytime we see angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it, we, should, we should perk up because that, that actually signifies something. Anytime we see that in the Old Testament, it is, represents the pre-incarnate Christ. It's called a Christophany, a visible manifestation of Christ in the Old Testament. And so that's what we see here. This verse speaks to Christ's coming, his advent, specifically his first advent that is preceded by the messenger, John the Baptist. And so Malachi, he speaks of this messenger as, as coming suddenly. But that doesn't necessarily mean immediate, right? We already know from the history that it was over 400 years before this prophecy was fulfilled. There was a time there, this fulfillment. But the messenger of the covenant, the long-waited Messiah, has come. Finally, the rebuilt temple that was expected to be filled with God's glory, greater than before, as it says in Haggai 2.9, that was realized in Jesus' incarnation. God's glory had returned to his temple. God's favor and blessing, promised to all the nations through Abraham, was being realized through Jesus. The nature of his coming was to be a blessing of redemption to Jews and Gentiles alike. And, and I could stop there. There's a lot here, and, I, and we, got, we got a couple, so we've got some more stuff to cover, but, but can we just pause for a moment? This is, that's cause for celebration, church. Jesus is here. Jesus has come. The promise has come. It's attainable. Salvation is real. The invitation is open. Jesus has come. We can celebrate Advent with great rejoicing because we walk in the beautiful, free gift of God's mercy and grace. Jesus has come. And so we see this redemption and this blessing explicitly in his first advent. God incarnate. He came initially to redeem, but also to purify and to judge. Verse, verses 2 and 5 are directed towards Jesus' second advent with words that reference his coming in the day of the Lord. In, in Scripture, by the way, uh, it's consistently we, we see this, the representative of Christ's second advent as the day of the Lord. 
day of the Lord, the day of his coming. And it highlights the final purification and judgment of God's people. But I, I, I also want to say this, too, and this is the nature of just prophets um, kind of um, speaking as God inspired them to speak, led by the Holy Spirit, as we just read, um, but, but also speaking of a first and a second advent in the same passage, that there are, there are times where, where the prophecies actually, actually have a partial fulfillment and a completed or a full co- fulfillment as well. And, and we, we see that here, that, that we, we, we don't want, I'm just, I'm cautioning you to, to not look at this and be like, well, one is only the first advent and everything else is only the second advent. Because there are elements here that we, we, we see in our own lives and our own hearts that can be realized in a partial fulfillment here and now as we await eagerly for Christ to return. In chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, we see the advent of Christ coming with salvation and purification and justice. So look again with, with me at, at verses 2 through 5. This is how I kind of want, want to frame this, and, 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 and here we'll, we'll kind of tie it all to, together. Um, but remember, we had those threefold charges in verse 17. Well, what basically happens in verses 2 through 5 is the response to those charges. The, the response to those accusations that they had against God, there's a response here. So you have the first charge, which was they, they accused God of seeing evil as a good thing, and the, and the response is in verses 2 and 3. These, these verses speak of purification, which, me, which means the removal of impurities. Purification is only necessary, by the way, if evil is not good. Think about that. Purification is only necessary if evil is not good. If, if evil is good, then there's no need for purification. There's no, no need to change. It's a remo- removal of impurities. And so by that definition, if, if purification is seen as a, as a process, it can really, it can be likened to sanctification. Sanctification is the, is the process of, of us becoming more and more like Jesus throughout our lifetime. Paul in 2 Corinthians puts it like this, from, from one degree, degree of glory to another, becoming more and more like Christ each day. So purification then is fulfilled in both the first and the second advent, right? Because we can actually, we can be slowly become more and more like Christ. Sanctification happens in our lifetime. Now, purification is happening in our lifetime. It's this process, this reality, but it's also brought to completion when Christ comes again. And Malachi, he gives two analogies to aid in this concept of purification. He talks about this, the refiner's fire and the, the fuller's soap. The refiner's fire was this intense heat that separated the dross, the, the impurities from pure metal. So you would, just, you would heat up metal and get it really, really hot, and the impurities would naturally separate from the pure metal and then you would just remove the impurity, right? You, you have this, this, this reference of the, the fuller soap. The fuller, it was, it, it was another, an old, old-time archaic word for launderer, somebody that, does, that washes clothes, right? And soap, if, if you ever, ever, ever tried making soap, um, there's a couple different times, types of making soap, ways of making soap, and uh, if you use lye, it's a lot more... Um, toxic and dangerous than the other way, right? And so lye is, is a very, very strong chemical for cleaning. Very, very strong chemical. And so the concept here is that with the soap is that you would use this really, really strong chemical of cleaning. It's, it's of the washing of the stain. It's a cleaning of the stain of sin. It, actually, what, what, what the fuller would do is they would actually, they would scrub the clothes really, really hard, and then they would throw them on a bunch of rocks, and they'd start beating those clothes with sticks. It sounds like a pretty painful process, doesn't it? <laughs> but that, but that's, the, that's the analogy we see here. Both of these analogies stress the, the thoroughness and the severity of pur- purification. The dross of iniquity, the stain of sin needed to be separated. It needed to be removed. The process of purification emphasized the the reality of sin in our world, as well as the necessity to take drastic measures to remove it from our lives. So think about about this for a moment in your own life in relation to what we just read about the Israelites and their sinful hearts. The Israelites were blind to their own sin, and it gave them courage to question God's goodness, to question God's love for them. 
Do you ever find yourself comparing your righteousness to other people? Do you justify your own sin by comparing yourself to others? Comparing yourself to people that you have deemed less righteous or faithful in your estimation? Have you grown callous and indifferent to your sin? And if you have, how has that affected your relationship with the Lord? If you've grown callous to your own sin, you need to repent. You need to repent, which means that you confess your sin and you turn away from that sin. It means to seek humbly to walk in God's free gift of grace. Jesus has paid the penalty for your sin. He has suffered and died in your place so that you can then respond with repentance and faith. Purification or sanctification is necessary because evil is not good and because we are all sinners in need of purification, in need of becoming more like Jesus, in need of of rooting the sin out of our hearts and our lives. The second charge and the second response we see here in verse 4, they'd accused God of delighting in evil. And in verse four, first of all, verse two and three, they, they talks about the priests, the, the Levites. And in verse four and five, it kind of broadens that out to the Israelites. It broadens that out to all of God's people. And he's not, so he's not just calling out the, 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 the priest to purification. He's calling that all of the people to offer right worship to God. God does not delight in evil as they accused him of, but rather he delights in right worship, in pure offerings. He delights in these offerings. God calls us to be purified, to remove, to, remove, to remove the impurities of the sin in our hearts. And we do that through repentance. We do that by, by having faith in Christ and what he's done for us. And when we do that, we are primed to worship him completely. God calls us to worship him in spirit and truth. He calls us to, to offer up our lives, our bodies as living sacrifices. Living sacrifices, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Living sacrifices because Christ has already died. We, know what, we don't need to die for our sins. Christ has already died for our sins. From delighting in evil, God deli- despises it. They, they, they accused him of delighting in evil. He, des, he despises it. And rather, he delights in the contrast. He delights in what is true, what is honorable, what is just, what is pure, what is lovely, what is commendable, what is excellent, what is praiseworthy, as Paul says in Philippians 4. He delights in true and right worship. And then we see in verse 5, the the, the third response. They had accused God of lacking justice. The prophet Malachi's response is that God is a God of justice. And his justice will always come at the right time. His justice is perfect and his justice is swift. He will bring swift witness, it says. God, through Malachi, says that he will be the swift witness against their sins the words, the injustices, the, the sins that they mention here in verse 5, they're, they're, they're participles in, in, in Hebrew. They're, they're, they're participles, meaning they're, there's this ongoing, continual behavior that's happening. Sin that is committed repeatedly without acknowledgement or repentance. It mentions uh, sorcery. It mentions adultery. Swearing falsely. Oppression against the marginalized. The lack of fear toward God. All all sin is deserving of judgment. These are just the ones that God emphasizes for this particular time and place and people. But the point is, is that God isn't just, they say, where is God? He lacks judgment. He doesn't care about being just. They missed it. God doesn't just care about justice. God is a God of justice. God is just. When we, when, when, I, when we describe each other, we describe someone, we say they're like this or they, they represent this or they, they resemble that. God doesn't resemble justice. God doesn't resemble love. God doesn't resemble holiness. He is the epitome of what that is. We, we define and we measure everything else that we know and understand in this world by God as our standard. And God is a God of justice. Well, he will ensure that justice is served. And, and, and that, that brings us kind of the end of where we're, where we're going this morning. And we're going to pick it up next week and, and finish the book. But as we close, I want to, I, I want to just kind of press in a few, lo- few thoughts as, as we've been doing throughout this series. 
So as we, as, I realize there's a lot there. There's a lot there. But as we, as we see the Israelites in their, their flagrant sin, we see the reality of our human hearts. If you've never been confronted with that before, the reality of, of the sin in your own life and your own heart, don't miss that today. And I say, I say that not because the, the reality of our depravity and our sin is an encouraging thought, but, but because that is, the, that is the, the on-ramp for us to understand and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. So don't miss that today. Don't, don't miss what we see here. We are prone to ignore our sin, to become blinded to it. We are prone to question God rather than acknowledge and take responsibility for our sin. We are prone to compare ourselves to others rather than to the standard of holiness that God gives us. We are prone to nosedive obliviously toward hell. But God in his faithfulness, in spite of the condition of our hearts, based upon his promises, provides a messenger that changes everything. So we're gonna talk more uh, next week about the promise that is coming, but today, this morning, church, be, be encouraged by God's promise of the Messiah's coming. Be encouraged this morning. Let's take great joy in the reality that the first advent has been fulfilled. Let's relish in what that, what that means for our lives and for our future. Jesus has come, church. The wait for salvation, the wait for redemption is over. Christ has come into our hearts and that is, is reason for advent celebration as far as I'm concerned. And remember, remember God's goal for our lives. God's goal for, our, for, for my life and for your life is, is to conform us, that purification is to conform us into the image of his son. It's not to make us happy, though he delights when we find joy in him. It's not to make us healthy, though he delights when we can fully serve him. It's not to make us wealthy, though we steward our lives and all that we have as his great gifts. No, God's goal is to conform us into the image of his son. Let's celebrate the advent this morning. Let's celebrate the advent this season together as a family, as a body of believers. Let's celebrate what Christ has done, that Christ has come. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. God, that as we, as we come this morning, God, and we come to this, this very important passage, God, it's not, it's not without its challenges. It's not without its, its, its judgments. It's not, not without its harsh words, God. But I pray that we wouldn't miss the promise here. God, don't allow us to, 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 to miss it this morning, to miss what you have for us here this morning in your word. And God, I, I am ecstatic to think that your first advent has already been fulfilled. And by that advent, by your coming, by your condescension, by your coming down and you living amongst us, God, and living a sinless life and dying on the cross for our sins and defeating death. By your advent, God, we can have life eternal. By your advent, Lord, we, we can be saved. God, thank you. I thank you for your love. God, I thank you that we, we don't have to sit here stumbling over these existential questions of who you are and what our purpose is and why we're doing because god you are good you are good and you fight for good and you love good you created good you, de you desire good for us god and i pray that we would acknowledge you today i pray that we would give you the glory today god i pray as we continue to 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 approach uh, the, the advent, the, 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 the celebration of your son's birth. God, that we would understand and we would love uh, to, to celebrate and to share with others this time of your advent, this time of this promise fulfilled that changes everything. This advent changes everything. 
not just in our lives, in our families, in our community. It changes everything about the course of history. It changes everything in our world. This one Advent changes everything. God, allow it to change our hearts today. Thank you for loving us. God, thank you for bringing us your word. God, thank you for, for, for blessing us and encouraging us with your, your, your pro- prophecy fulfilled. And we pray all these things, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus.